Hey, welcome to Discovery. So glad you guys are here. Let me look into that camera. Welcome everyone joining us online again. Everyone in our outdoor courtyard, we got misters and fans out there now, and our Discovery Northwest campus. Come on, make some noise if you're excited to hear God's word today. <laughs> Amen. We're in the eighth installment of a series called Dream to Destiny. We've been studying the life of jo Joseph. Before I jump in, though, let me ask you a question, because I know like, when I get around some guys, and especially guys that are in the military or have a rough past, like we'd like to tell war stories in wound and scar stories. How many ever done that where you were around some people, you were like, what scar do you have? Well, so how many ever, uh, let's do a little study here today, okay? How many have ever broken a bone? Anyone ever broken a bone in here? Yeah, a lot of people broken some bones up in here. I actually had a broken collarbone as part of like when I was born, the delivery process. I got my, I, I came into the world broken, you guys. And so it should have been an indicator of what my life was going to be like, but but how about let's let's kind of continue to progress this thing. Let's go to another level. How many of you have ever had at like one time more than 30 stitches? More than 30 stitches? More than 30 stitches? Yeah, there but there's some awesome stories up in here with that one. Okay. All right. Let's take it to another level. Where are my knife wound people? And I'm not talking about kitchen knife wounds. Let's go, knife wound people. Whoa, huh? You guys got some story. What happened? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, all right. All right, now you've got to be brave. Let's be, let's be brave here, okay? Where are my gunshot wound people? Gunshot wound, gunshot wound. Now you want to leave their road, don't you? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm joking. I've never been, I don't have a gunshot wound, okay? But I have shot someone before with a BB gun. With a BB gun, stop. <laughs> so I heard the gasp in the room right now. Everyone was like, ooh, I'm leaving. When do we, let's, uh, like, I'm a pastor, shoot somebody. You know, you know when you're a kid and you're like, you know, you know, sh I'll shoot you and you shoot me. You guys used to do that. Girls don't know what we're talking about. Every guy in this room knows what I'm talking about. You're like, we've been shot by pellets and BBs and stuff like that. Here's here's what I know. I know, like every single one of us, every single one of us, we all have like wound stories and different wounds, whether it's you know physical wounds like that. Here's what I know for sure. After years of doing ministry and pastoring, every single person has a heart wound. And what I, know about, like, what I know about these wounds, both physical and heart, because of ministry, like your physical wounds, you got some scars and stories, and you can look at them, but it's those wounds of your heart that actually hurt the most. And they actually cut the deepest, and they linger the, the longest, and they affect us the most. And today is about those, those heart wounds, those relational wounds that every single one of us, all of us have probably stories that we could tell we've been wounded in our heart. We had a relational disappointment. Maybe you lost somebody you loved. Some of you, you lost a child, you lost a marriage, or you're a child of divorced parents, or you had a mom or a dad who was very abusive verbally to you, or, or emotionally to you, or critical, or negative, could not speak positive to you. And you have these wounds that you're carrying around I know, I know most people, and I would, I'm saying most, but it's all, it's all. Every one of us has been wounded, you guys. I'll even say that every single one of us have wound stories, emotional, relational wound stories. But I also know this. Very few of us deal with it properly. You know, because we, we know what to do with the physical wound. Even some of you don't do it. I'm, I'm, I, I've had a hurt rib for like a month, you guys. And my, my wife's like, go to the doctor. I'm like, eh. And so how much more, like, and that's something I can, I, it's external here, but those things that you can't even see we, we, that are hurting us and, and affecting us, and we don't, we're just like, eh, nah, I'm good. I'm good, and it's really affecting, and here's what people say, oh, let time, time will heal that. Time heals all wounds. Time does not heal all wounds, you guys. In fact, if you don't deal with it properly, time makes it worse. It just gets deeper. It gets more calcified. It starts to affect the other areas of your life that are healthy and your body that's healthy. If yeah, Time is part of the process. It, it is part of the process, but it is dealing with it properly in time is actually what we need. And today we're going to talk about the pardon test. We've been talking about these tests that we need to pass to fulfill our destiny Joseph passed these different tests throughout his life, and we're applying it to our life. In order to, pass, in order to fulfill his destiny, he had to be tested. He had to develop the character to fulfill it. And if you are going to fulfill your destiny, you have to pass this test. It's called the pardon test. This test is about forgiving others of those offenses, forgiving others of the abuses 
towards you in your life. Every one of us are going to have to face this. And if you think about like Joseph's life here, Joseph had to like get over and let go a lot. He had to let go of a lot of stuff. He had to find healing from some deep wounds, from from his dysfunctional family that he was raised in, from, from his brothers who would abuse and mistreat him and couldn't even speak a kind word to him. He had to get over the, the mental scars and the emotional scars of just being in that family dynamic. And, that, that, and then they sell him into slavery. They physically abuse and hurt Joseph. And he's got to heal from that in order to fulfill his destiny. He gets wrongly accused and thrown in prison and and then he gets forgotten by a buddy in there. He makes a buddy in prison, and his own friend forgets him when he gets out and doesn't remember him. And so he's, got, he's let down by everybody, and he's got all these wounds that if he doesn't deal with them properly, then they could undermine, they could short-circuit, they could, they could prevent him from fulfilling his potential and his destiny in his life. So we're going to pick up the story of Joseph, you guys, in Genesis chapter 45. And at this time of the story, Joseph, remember if you were here last week, Joseph is prime minister now. He has stepped into his destiny. He has yet to fulfill it, but he stepped into the assignment of his destiny. If you were here last week, the reason, how we got there was by interpreting the dream of Pharaoh. Pharaoh has this dream, and he says, hey, the dream means the, there's going to be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine and drought. And so we're going to pick up the story in the second year of famine. So there's already been seven years of plenty and they stored up grain, and then there, there were two years into famine and drought all over the world it is, and all around Egypt. Well, two years into this famine, Joseph's family is actually experiencing the same drought. They don't have grain, they don't have food, their, their cattle is dying, everything is, their livelihood's going away, and their father says, hey, in Egypt, we hear they got grain. Like, there's something happening in Egypt. They actually have supply. We don't know what's happening, but you need to go get some of that supply that they have in Egypt so that our family can be sustained, so we can live. So his brothers go, and you can go read this story. It's actually a really cool story. We don't have time to get into all of it. But his brothers go and and, and interact with, they actually interact with Joseph, and they don't even recognize him. There's been such a transformation in Joseph's life that he is even unrecognizable to his brothers. And, and, and I like to say, that's what God will do inside of your life. We're, we're like, when someone sees you from years ago, they go, you look like a brand new person. This is Joseph, who's like unrecognizable, and he kind of plays with them a little bit. You can go read the story. He has some fun with them, but at some point, he just breaks down. He can't take it anymore. So look what it says in Genesis 45, verse 1. Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants, and he cried out, have everyone leave my presence, and he's just there with his brothers. So Joseph, it says, so there was no one there with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, and boy, are you guys in trouble. No, that's not what he said. I'm just kidding. I'm Joseph, you're going to get it now, now. It is not, that's what like we would have done, a lot of people would have done, but Joseph has gone through a process of maturation and of development and of character, and, and he's just not that guy that would do that. He responds very differently because of the trial has formed something in Joseph that is, that is pure, and he says, I'm Joseph. Is my father still living? He's caring about his family, but his brothers weren't even able to answer him because they were terrified. At his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. Like, I still want you here. I know you hurt me, but here, come on in. I'm safe. I'm safe. Come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves. He's even, so he's, he, he's helping them now, ministering to them. Look, I'm not angry with this. I'm not bitter about it. And I don't want you to be bitter about this either. You need to let this go too for yourself. For selling me here. Because, look what he says. It was to save the lives that God sent me. Like actually it wasn't even you who sold me into slavery. God was behind the scenes. Working things out that I couldn't understand. You couldn't understand for his good. For my good and his glory. God sent me through tests and trials. I am where I'm standing here today. Don't be angry at yourself. This was the hand of God. Wow. I believe God wants to do a miracle in your life today, church. 
I believe he wants to do such a, a work in your heart, in your wounds that you're still carrying around today. Some of the things that you're carrying around are preventing you from your potential, the wounds of your past. And the, things, the thing about this like relational wound and the heart wound, one of the worst things about it is you don't even recognize that that wound is the source of all the other issues and problems that you're having in your life. Like you're not able to connect the dots and I've been praying for you that you would be able to, through the Holy Spirit, make some connections today that the reason why you're not happy in your marriage isn't even about them. The reason why you still, you know, the way that you, you're, not, you're not happy or you're still depressed or you're dealing with anxiety or you have some of you have sickness in your mind and in your body, it's not really, it's actually about that wound that you have not got healed from. And you can't connect the dots to the very source of the stronghold in your life. So let me share with you first a few things about relational wounds, and then we're going to talk about how, how Joseph passed the pardon test and how we need to as well. But there's important things we need to understand about these relational wounds. If you're taking notes with me, write these down. The first thing is that whenever you have these relational wounds, it will keep you from your destiny. It will prevent you from arriving to the place where you're supposed to be and you're supposed to go if you never deal with the wound or the problem or the hurt or the pain. In fact, I've noticed this. I don't know if you've noted this about like when you get hurt, when you have a heart wound or a relational wound, you become irrational. Do you ever get like wounded by someone that you, by the way, the, the worst wounds, the people that are going to hurt you the most are the people you love the most, you trust the most, or you've helped the most. And when you get wounded by those people, you get, you get a little crazy. No, for real, you get, don't, you get a little irrational. You can act crazy. You can start doing things and acting in ways that you would never act otherwise except from the wounds of the heart from people that we've allowed in. I talk to like, people all the time, couples especially all the time, that they've hurt each other so much that they're contemplating doing things, decisions that are irrational, that make no sense, that are just going to cause more pain and heartache and trauma to their, themselves and to their children, and they're convincing themselves that this is the right thing to do now because they're so hurt. They're so wounded. It's just, it's irrational. In fact, let me show you, Psalm 73 actually says as much. He says, when my heart was grieved and my spirit was embittered, meaning I'm just so bitter in my spirit, I was senseless and ignorant. He says, I was like a brute beast or an animal. I became not even like, I started reacting in a carnal nature, man, just biting and clawing. And like, I was angry. And that's what happened when you, when you hold on to it. You get crazy. I just lost my mind. Which means, by the way, you need to have people in your life that you really deeply love. That when you're going through hurt, because I'm telling you, you're not the smartest person when you're hurt. You don't make the best decisions when you're hurt, okay? You, you need some people in your life that love you enough to tell you you're stupid right now. Stop. Hey, no, 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 no. Actually, you shouldn't make a decision right now. This ain't, hey, stop it. You need some people in your life that love you enough to say, no, 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 stop. You don't need to because you tell the wrong person. Some of you are getting around the wrong people, and they're just jumping into the crazy with you. You're like, yeah, yeah, he's such an idiot, you know? Quit. I quit. If I, if I were you, I quit. I don't know what you're doing there still. You know, you're around the wrong people. Around the wrong people. You need to get around some people that let you know when you're being senseless, ignorant, when you're acting out of a wound instead of acting from a place of healing and wholeness. You got to have people that love you enough, okay? Because if you don't, it's going to keep you from your destiny. See, the, the thing is, I see this all the time, you guys. When the enemy is attacking your life, when he's attacking like your marriage or your relationships and he's causing these, these relational wounds and heart wounds, whether it's your dad, your mom, your marriage, and just, just people in general. The enemy isn't really after that relationship. Listen to me, you guys. The attack of the devil isn't after that relationship. The attack of the devil is always, it's actually to derail your destiny. That's the purpose. He's just using the relationship to bring the wound that'll keep you from being who God has called you to be. The enemy's plan for Joseph was to create misdirected, distracted, a bitter heart. He was using the, the challenge to do it. He's using the challenge of your marriage to stop something bigger. 
He's using the challenge of the pit to keep you from the palace. He's using the challenge of the prison to keep you from your purpose. But we get all locked in in the situation, and I'm telling you, there's something bigger at stake, and it's your destiny. Okay, so, so you need to understand this about relational wounds. If we don't deal with them, it'll keep you from your destiny. The second thing is, if you don't deal with them properly, it'll pollute your other relationships. It doesn't just stay there in that one relationship. It actually affects all the other ones, like the good ones, the ones that are healthy. I don't know if you've ever been around a wounded person and you're trying to love them and they love you and you know they love you, but they just can't even love well anymore because of the past relationship that hurt them. You ever been around that person that you love them and you're trying to love them well and you know they love you, they just don't know how to love because they're still jacked up over what happened to them. Or maybe you're that person. Maybe you're that, that dad or that guy that you find yourself getting mad and doing things and saying things that you didn't. And then you walk out and you walk away and you go, why did I say that? Why did I do that? I mean, I actually like them. I actually love them. And I, why did I say, why did I hurt them? You know why? Because you got a wound that you're not dealing with. It's true. Whenever you've been wounded, you'll start having a negative impact on the people around you that are actually positive. For men, this is so easy to spot for me. I love it. I love doing this because I'll, I'll look at guys sincerely. Like I'll, I'll, I'll eye lock with some brothers and I'm like, hey bro, I love you. And I'll make it weird. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'll like deep voice it and stuff like, I love you, man. And, and so almost weird, you know, that, that, that borderline place, just to see how they react to it. Because if they get all weird and uncomfortable about it, or if they can't say it back, I'm like, ah, you got a stronghold there, man. Something's going on. And, and so they can't, because of they, they were hurt or you've been hurt, it's hard for you to love other people or reciprocate love to others. And, and it's affecting the relationships. Or, or maybe it's not like the hurt that you think. Because one thing I see affecting people so much and polluting relationships is, is the wound of rejection. So you've been rejected, and here's what happens when I'll go to, especially a brother, man, because uh, I, I, I can see that they got to reject. Here's the spirit behind that. The spirit of rejection says this. Inside, they're saying this. You don't love me, because if you loved me, you would. And you fill in the blank. Whatever it is, whatever story the enemy has convinced you love looks like that you didn't get when you were nine. Because if you love me, you show up for me. If you love me, you play basketball with me. If you love me, you watch the game on Friday night with me. And so the enemy has convinced you that, that to, re, to reject people before they reject you and convince you that love is something that it actually isn't, that you, can, that you can only love people that like, as if Jesus only loved his 12 and didn't love every single person that he interacted with and healed. And so what happened, so you, you, if you have a spirit of rejection, you have a small, tight circle and you are prevented from your destiny. Because you don't love me. Who are you? You don't love me. You don't love me. Only, you know, you know only, only, the, uh, only these people. I got, my, I got my people. Those people really love me. And it keeps you from being who God has called you to be. It's, it's polluting. In fact, Hebrews 12, 15 says a bitter spirit. It's not only bad in itself. Like, that's bad in itself because it's affecting you. But look what it says. But it also poison the lives of everyone else around you. So yes, it's affecting you. It's, it's preventing your destiny. But what you don't realize, because you're not managing your own wholeness and your healing and taking ownership of what has happened to you, because you're not dealing with it properly, you're not affecting you, just affecting your destiny, but you're actually affecting the destiny of the people you love the most around you. You're messing the destiny of your kids up now. Of, of, of the people that, are, that, that you care about the most. Now you're messing with their destiny. Your lack of dealing with it is poisoning the people around you. And when that happens, it does a few things. It, it, for the first thing I see it doing is it makes us defensive. Some of you, we don't deal with it, and it's affecting your relationships, and you're getting, you get defensive. That's, what happening, that's what's happening to, to some of us, where someone else hurts me, and I'm just going to put a wall up, and no one else is going to hurt me again, and we protect ourselves. And that's what happens from some people. As you have that rejection and that wall, and, and they can't reciprocate love. It'll, it'll prevent you from that wall you think is perfect protecting you will prevent you from allowing the people in that God designed to help you. Like, like, like the pastor that actually is, God has given you in your life to take you on a journey to get whole, to get closer to Jesus. It'll keep you at a place of like, you don't love me. You don't love me. That's what the enemy wants you to think. 
Are you hearing me, you guys? Are you with me? It'll keep you defensive. It, it, it'll, it'll make you, for some of you, it makes you distant. And this, because some of you have done it. This is what you do when you got that. You'll, you'll end conversation like this. You, you, you'll say something like this. And of discussion. You know what I mean? Like, that's it. That's it. You just, and, and for some of you, you just kind of call. You just, that's it. That's all. Or others of you ladies, or maybe you just distance yourself. You just go, you, you kind of, you kind of just remove yourself from it. And you're tolerating things in your life by distance. And you're distancing yourself from it and not dealing with it is not actually going to heal it. You got to actually deal with it. Okay? Because it's going to pollute the relationships. It'll make us defensive, distant, or the opposite really of that is it makes us demanding. You ever see a real mean, controlling kind of person? And you think like, what got under their skin? How did they become like that? Where they're just dominating and constantly controlling everything around you? Can I tell you something about that person? They're probably the most insecure person that you know. Because on the, on the outside, it looks like they got it all together and they got all the power, but really they're scared to death inside. That's what insecure people do is they try to grab control of people and things all around them because they're, they're afraid of not having the control. They're not secure in themselves, so they got to grab at everything. It'll pollute your relationships. The last thing, the most tragic thing about this whole heart wound and relational wound that, that happens in life is it actually destroys our relationship with God. And I'm going to say something that some of you don't know, but it, you, it, it can set you free. It can help you get towards freedom today if you understand this. And that is our relationship with God is inseparable from our relationship with people. It's inseparable. All throughout the Bible it says you cannot say you love God and you don't love people. I did a whole book study on this recently called First John, the whole book of 1 John. And all throughout the first book of 1 John, you go watch that sermon series. That is one of the main themes that comes back. You can't say you love God and you don't love people. People, you can't say, me and God are good, me and God are good. I just don't get along with, with, with people very well. You're either not being honest with yourself or you're not being honest with God. It's, just, it's not. It can't. It's inseparable, you guys. It's connected. And for some of you that are thinking like, maybe you and God haven't been able to connect well lately. You're like, man, I just feel like it, it, it could be. It most likely is. God is waiting for you to get some things right here before he takes you to the next level here. Let me show it to you. Mark chapter 11, Jesus actually says that fact. He says, you know, when you come to me and you pray, when you're praying, look what comes next. First. So he says, look, this is how I want you to come to me. I want you to actually do something before you come to me. Because it's going to affect what, how you receive what I need to give you. In fact, you can't even receive what I need to give you if you don't do something first. So when you come to me and you pray, you got to first do something. Do something because I really want to get something to you. You got to forgive everyone you're holding a grudge against. So that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Jesus is basically saying, don't come to me unless you go to them. Why is that? Why is that so important to God? Because he knows that you're not going to be able to receive what he wants to give you if you have that wall in your spirit. And actually, it's completely wrong to say, God, I need all this forgiveness, and I'll take all this forgiveness from you, but I ain't giving it to nobody else. Or, or I'll give it to them, but not them. Because I have tolerance for that, but I ain't got no tolerance for that. There's the... It's dangerous. It's just dangerous, you guys. It can keep you from your, your, your destiny. All of us will have to pass this part and test. We're all going to be wounded in our heart, from our relationships. And, and then here, let me show you. In Genesis chapter 50, this is now 20 years later from that first incident. Okay, a lot of time has passed by. He was 39 years old when he met his brothers. Now he's like 59 years old. But at this time, like he's been taking care of his brothers, his, gave them land, taking care of the kids and everything. Joseph has been providing for his family up to this point, but his dad passes away 20 years later. And it brings up another incident and probably resurfaces some wounds. Check this out in Genesis chapter 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded. Okay, so there's nothing really in the scriptures that show us that this, this actually happened. 
that he never, like, like his father never commanded them to go tell Joseph something. Here his brothers are, 20 years later, still telling stories, manipulating the situation and the facts. Like, how do you, and up to this time, you guys, even up to this time, they had not even repented. They have never asked Joseph for forgiveness. Nothing recorded to say, forgive us, we have sinned against you. Nothing. How do you forgive people that don't even ask or want your forgiveness? How do you forgive people in your life that are still being manipulative? That are still spinning stories, trying to control the narrative? Okay? Okay, look, look what happens, though. He says, before your father died, he commanded, like he didn't command, he commanded saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin. They've never come saying, forgive us of our sin. No, no, dad says, forgive us of our sin. For they did evil, not we did evil, they did evil on you. Now please forgive the trespass of these servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His father had passed away. He's, he's broken. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face and said, Behold, we are your servants. Can we do something? We still haven't, you know, asked for forgiveness, but okay, maybe we can repay you. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I, am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. There was a purpose in order to bring it about as it is to this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. Like, I don't, I, I, God is the one behind this. I know, look, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And not only am I going to forgive you, but I'm going to provide for you. Because I know God has blessed me to be a blessing. That's what he's blessed. He's blessed me to be a blessing, and I'm not going to. You can handle this however you want. You can spin stories and be manipulative at all you want, but I know God has blessed me to be a blessing. And look what it says. He comforted them and spoke kindly to them. His brothers that couldn't even speak a kind word to them. I'm not going to repay your evil for evil. No, I'm going to bless you and speak kind to you because God has blessed me and been kind to me an amazing transformation we see in joseph's life how do we how do we pass this test what do we what do we do to pass the pardon test and not allow the wounds of our past and our heart to derail us from our destiny okay let me give you four keys today that we see in joseph that we need to apply to our life if you want to pass this test i'll tell you right off the bat they're counterintuitive and you're not gonna like it but if you want to pass the test, there's no other way. This is, this is the biblical way to pass the pardon test, okay? And the first thing is you got to reveal the hurt. And I know we don't like that because you've been hiding it for a long time. You've been stuffing it down and putting on a smile and acting like it's okay. Maybe for some of you, you have never, ever told anybody about that one wound. Let me tell you something. Here's why this is important. You can't heal what you don't reveal, your life will be so much better if at least one other person know what you are really thinking and feeling on the inside of you. This is why small groups exist here at Discovery Church because it's that place that, that I mean, you can hear in here. You can, you can feel it in here. Like, like I might give you a gut punch in here and you're like, ooh, that was me. Oh my goodness, that was a good word and stuff. But, but nothing changes. That's not how you're changed just because you heard the word. You actually change when you get around some other brothers or sisters in Christ and you go, hey, you know what he was saying last Sunday? That's me. Uh, I, I got that. Can you pray for me? That is where you can receive. That's the revelation and the revealing that we need. Let me show you in Scripture. Psalm 32 says this. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Like it actually affected my health. When I just tried to stuff it down and I didn't speak about it, I didn't reveal it to nobody, I, my, my health, my body felt the the wound of that relationship. And some of you have felt that. Some of you have called in sick when you got hurt emotionally and relationally. But 
affected you, didn't you? Didn't it? That's, that's what he's talking about here, because you didn't reveal the wound. Psalm 39 and 2. But when I was silent and still, not even saying anything good, my anguish increased. Listen to me. Listen to me. Look up here. Listen. If you don't reveal that hurt and tell somebody, that scripture is going to be it's going to be yours. It'll come true in your life. Your anguish will increase. I'm telling you, it's half the battle is just inviting somebody in and saying, that's me. This happened to me. And it did hurt. It did hurt. It doesn't make you less of a man. It doesn't make you less of a child of God to reveal it and say, this is what happened. It's, 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 it, you have to. You got to. Because you can't heal what you don't reveal. If you want to pass the pardon test, it's not, you don't just reveal it. But the second thing, I know you ain't going to like it, but the second thing is you got to release the people that hurt you. you gotta, you got to let it go. And I wish I could tell you there's another solution than releasing this and letting it go, but there just isn't. There, there isn't. And, and truth be known, listen, the longer you hold on to it, the more you're going to look like them. You know, it, it, just, it just is. Like you're... You'll end up doing the same things that somebody did to you the longer you hold on to it and don't deal with it the right way. You know, it's it just, it, it's an amazing thing. And here's, here's why. Here's, here's the principle behind that. You become whatever you behold. Whatever you're, some, you're you just got in your mind. You're meditating on it. It's, it's, it's what you think about. And you see, when you, when you see that person, when you're scrolling, you're like, or someone, you've tried to block them, but it just, it comes, and, oh, and, and you behold it, and you behold it, and you behold it, and you behold it, and you're going to become, what you need to do is let it go and start beholding something different. You've got to release, take God's word and say, you know what, they don't deserve it, because it, it did hurt, and they were wrong, but I'm going to let you take care of it, God. And then people go, well, how many times, because people have been messing, how many times do we get, Peter asked that question. Remember, Peter asked that question. How many times? Matthew chapter 18. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he does that? Because he did it once and then he did it again. Because like, so what's the line here? There's got to be a line, right? By the way, Jewish law was three times. It was three times. So Peter probably thought he was being super spiritual and religious, given a holy number or something. Seven times, Jesus? How about seven? And Jesus goes, you're not even close. Not seven times, but 77. Some of your translations say 70 times seven times. See, Peter was trying to solve the forgiveness equation using math. It was the wrong equation, okay? Because write it down like this. Forgiveness is not about keeping score. It's about losing count. That's the principle. Jesus wasn't saying, okay, count it up to 70 times seven now in one day or 77. No, that's not the principle. That's not what he's saying. What he was saying is stop keeping score. Just lose count. Just keep on. Just keep on forgiving. Why does that? If, if you want to do some Bible study later, go read the rest of Matthew chapter 18. And it'll show you, it'll blow your mind. Jesus tells this parable of this manager who owed millions of dollars to his master. His master brings into account the debt that he owes. And he says, repay the debt. But it was a debt he could not pay. This is a principle or a story, a parable that reflects what Jesus did for us and paid our debt on the cross, but he couldn't pay it. And he said, well, that's, if you can't pay it, you're getting thrown in the dungeon. But this manager repents and he asks for forgiveness and mercy and cries out to him. And the master was merciful and says, I forgive you your debt. Canceled, wiped clean, millions of dollars. You don't need to pay a thing. Oh, and the guy's so elated, he walks out of there and he goes immediately out the door and he sees someone that owed him a hundred bucks and he grabs him by the throat and starts choking him. Go read it's in the face of the Bible, y'all. He's choking him out. He's like, pay me my money. And then someone told on him, was like, hey, you just forgave him millions of dollars. He's out there choking that guy out. He's just for a hundred bucks. And so the master's like, bring him back in here. He brought him back in there. He said, how dare you? I forgave. What I forgave you, you should have been able to easily forgive them. And he threw him into the dungeon. And this is, this is a parable, a reflection of, of Jesus and his mercy and his forgiveness and how we should. And some people read that story and they go, well, what was that? What, did, does God take away our forgiveness then? No, 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 that's not what happened. I'll actually show you what happened. Theologically, I'll explain it. 
in, in, in a moment what was happening in that interaction. But Jesus is our example here in 1 Peter chapter 2. Look at this. When they hurled insults at him, he didn't retaliate when he suffered. When they were putting the nails in his hands, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly, to God who takes care of everything the right way. Okay? God will take care of it. You just need to give it to God. And here's why. If you never heal from what hurts you, then you're going to bleed all over people who didn't cut you. They're going to suffer the consequences of it. I remember years ago, I was having a hard time forgiving someone. I told you so, the, the, the wounds that are going to hurt the most are the people that, that you love the most, that you trust the most, and you help the most. And I was hurt by somebody, and I was having a hard time you know, forgiving in my quiet time. I was you know, brought to remembrance uh, again, and, and I, got, I, I felt the bitterness. Which, by the way, if you, if you ever wonder, like, oh, have I forgiven them? Because maybe you've said it. But if you see them or think about them, and you're still bitter and you have bitterness, anger, or wrath, Ephesians tells us to put away all bitterness, anger, and wrath. So if there's just bitterness, anger, and wrath, when you see or think about them, then you haven't forgiven them. Okay? And so I got bitter, and I, like, I just, I need to, and I'm trying to. And I felt like God speak to my spirit. I don't hear God audibly, you guys, but I felt the Lord speak to my spirit. And it, and it went like this, let it go, like that. Like, a, like almost a frustration behind it. God's all, let it go. And I was like, but God, because, you know, sometimes God doesn't have all the facts. And I'm like, but God. <laughs> that was a joke, right? You, you know, but God, maybe you forgot, like, what he did. Like, it was, he was wrong. He was wrong. And, and I really, and I'm, that's what I'm telling God. I'm like, but God. <laughs> and, and, I, and I felt the Lord go, of course he's wrong. You don't need to forgive people who are right. You need to forgive people if they're wrong. And I felt like, oh, I need a deeper revelation of forgiveness. So here's, it's, it's point three, but it really should be point one. I just put it in the journey of our discussion today. Uh, it, if you want to pass the pardon test, you actually have to receive the forgiveness of God. Let me show you, have you ever prayed the Lord's Prayer? I mean, a lot of you probably prayed the Lord's Prayer. I don't know if you know what you're praying when you're praying the Lord's Prayer. Okay, because it's a dangerous prayer. Let me show it to you. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray, and he goes, and forgive us our debts or our sins as we forgive our debtors. Here's, I don't know, that word as, you know what that word as means? It means just as, just in the same way. Is what it, that's what it literally means, in the same way. So when you pray the Lord's Prayer, what you were saying is, God, forgive me my sins the same way I forgive other people their sins. That would have been good information to know before you prayed that prayer, huh? Okay, so, so this is what God is, this is what the whole context of this prayer is actually a prayer about forgiveness because he goes back to it at the end. Let me show it to you. He says this, forgive us our debts as, in the same way, we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation, meaning if you don't forgive, you're going to be led into temptation. But deliver us from the evil one, meaning if you don't forgive, you are going to be in bondage to the devil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, meaning this, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It's not my, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. And then the next verse, look what he says. For if you forgive men their trespasses. See, the whole context of the Lord's Prayer is actually about forgiveness. It's actually about this wound that you need to deal with that's preventing you from receiving what God wants you to receive. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespass. Here's, here's what happened in that parable of the master. It wasn't God removing his forgiveness. What actually happened here was him not being able to forgive his employee revealed that he really didn't receive the forgiveness of his master. Because if you have a problem giving forgiveness, you have a problem receiving forgiveness. You may want to write that down somewhere. Okay, I believe there's a, yep, if you have a problem, there you go. If you think you're earning your forgiveness from God, you're going to make other people earn your forgiveness to them. If you think you deserve forgiveness, then, then you're going to see someone else's offense and you're going to, oh, they don't deserve it. Let me remind you, you don't deserve it. 
You do not deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. Matthew 10 and 8 says, freely you have received. Freely give. If you haven't freely received, then you won't freely give. If you think you're earning it, then you're going to expect everyone around you to earn it. I remember early in, in, in our marriage, me and Veronica, um, it might have been like the first couple years of our marriage or something, but I just remember like I, I roll over quite a bit and kick my legs and stuff like that. I got to get comfortable. We've gotten a really good, a better bed since then, but this like we had a really bad bed. But I like, I, I did this kind of thing and I elbowed her right in the dome, man. It was like, it was like, bonk, ah. And she even did, her eyes did one of these things, like, oh. and I was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And she's like, oh, oh, oh. And I just kept saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And she's like, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And I just like, and I'm like, I just was so bad. So I felt so bad. I just kept saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. And then she's just like, after a while, I'm sure she's like, okay, okay, leave me alone already. I know you were sorry when I married you. Just stop. Just leave me alone. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And then, and I'm like, and this was years ago when we first got married, you guys. But I was like, honey, let, I said, honey, I need you to do something for me. And she's like, what? Now? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I need you to just do And she's like, what? And I said, I need you to hit me. <laughs> she's like, what? What? I'm all, hit me right in my face. Hit me in my face. And she's like, she's like, why? What? Why? I'm like, because I hit you, I hurt you, you can hurt me, then we'll be even. Just hit me. I'll feel better if you just, if you just hit me in my face. What was I doing? What was I doing there? You know what I was doing? I was keeping score. If I do to you, then you should do to me, and then we're going to be even here. I needed a deeper revelation of forgiveness, and here's what you need to understand. God does not get even with you. He already got even through Jesus. God does not, when you do wrong, God doesn't punish you for your wrong. Do you know that? You are not punished for your wrong if you're a child of God. The punishment that was upon you was actually attributed to Christ. So any type of mixed theology where you feel like you're, like something is happening in your life, like you got a flat tire or something, you're like, oh, God's punishing me now because I didn't go to church on Sunday. And then it starts raining, you're like, oh, nice touch, God. Nice touch. Okay, God. Okay, God. No, that's not... That's just, you know, change out your tires before they get bare or something. I don't know. That's just maintenance. Just do your maintenance, okay? God's not punishing you. You need a deeper understanding of forgiveness. Freely, you have received, freely give. And then lastly, number four, once we do that, once we kind of like release those people, reveal the hurt, release the people that have hurt us, receive forgiveness, you can do number four, which is to refocus now on God's plan for your life. You can, you can re-put the energy and the time in, in where God is calling you to go and what, who He's calling you to be that can stop robbing you of your peace and your focus and your attention and your energy and your relationships. Don't let that incident stop you from the great potential that God put inside of you, the destiny that God is leading you towards. Don't let that hurt. Don't let that wound prevent you from passing the test. And here's Joseph. He has the power and an opportunity for revenge, for payback, and he chooses to pardon. Genesis 50, 20. Look at it again. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. This actually, God can use this to perfect my character. It's a test. So maybe, hey, maybe you're just seeing that incident from a lens of a victim instead of the, the, the victor that you are in Christ. Maybe, maybe the narrative that you're using when you remember and you're revealing that incident, maybe it, the, the narrative itself is keeping you bound. And you're not able to see, discern, the good that God can produce in you through the test of the wound and the relational disappointment. I love this quote by Michael de Montaigne. He says, a man is not hurt so much by what happens as by his opinions of what happens. And this is how you pass the pardon test. You got to think differently about that. You got to see the story of God in your life, in your journey. 
in, the, in your family dysfunction, in how they treated you, in how they abused you, in how they forgot you, to see that God was perfecting something inside of you that only pain, only the test could purify and make you who you are or who God wants you to be. But you got to pass the test. Reveal it. Release them. But first, really, you got to receive freely. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.